Hi everyone. Um, so this is our video about Lenz's Law. This is one of my favorite days in terms of demonstrations and I wish we were together to do it in class because it's really cool to see it live and in person. Um, it's a really dramatic demonstration so unfortunately we'll have to watch it on video. So Lenz's Law is all about induced magnetic fields um, due to the induced current. So we'll start just by looking at a video so let me kind of set this up. So we're going to have two long tubes, uh, one aluminum and one glass. And they're going to drop a magnet through each one. Okay. Um, and so the question that I want you to think of is aluminum a magnetic material? And is glass magnetic? Okay. Um, now the answer to the first question, a lot of people answer yes, but not all metals are magnetic. So if you, if you take a, a kitchen magnet and put it up against a, a soda can, um, it doesn't stick. There's no magnetic force there. So the answer to the, both of these questions is no. So when we drop a magnet through there, um, you might have an expe expectation of what's going on. So let's watch the video now. Oops, sorry. Wrong button. There we go. The sound here is kind of irrelevant. I don't think that matters. So the aluminum tube is on the left. The glass tube is on the right. have this unusual result that the we have this unusual result so the magnet in the aluminum did not experience free fall it takes longer than than expected to fall through the tube whereas the magnet that fell through the glass just fell normally Okay, so let's think about this. So let's look at the one through the glass tube because that's easier. So the one with the glass tube, if we're talking about free fall, if we draw a free body diagram or force diagram on here, we have a force downward equal to mg, and that is it. Okay, whereas the aluminum obviously did not have the acceleration that the one that fell through the glass, so we have mg and then there's some other force in the upward direction. Okay, so the question is what kind of force is that and how strong is it? So the idea here is where the so in the glass tube we know the acceleration is equal to little g. Here we know the acceleration is less than little g and it could even reach the point where if that upward force is equal to that we remember we call that zero acceleration and we call that terminal velocity. All right, so let's think about what's going on here. Okay, so it's a pretty complex situation. Okay, so the steps. As the magnetic falls through the metal tube, there's a changing magnetic field inside the tube. This is also the case in the glass tube, um, but the second step is the, is the difference between the two. So um, that changing magnetic field inside the, the, inside the metal tube induces a circular current in the tube. So if you're looking at the tube, um, the current is going to be running around the tube in circles. Okay, um, That obviously doesn't happen in the glass because glass is not a conductor. So this phenomenon happens with conducting materials, which is all metals, and there there is a difference actually between some of the different types of metals. Okay, all right, so what we know is that if we have a current that is 
a current will generate its own magnetic field and a circular current um, will basically be like a solenoid okay the magnetic field will be um, if you think about the the tube the magnetic field will be in the case of the video would be either up or down okay we have a circular current going around the tube and that produces a magnetic field either up or down um, and so the mag the induced magnetic field um, interacts with the magnet exerting a force upward okay and so we know that it's upward because the magnet is not accelerating um, with with an acceleration of little g it's much less than that so the upward force equals the gravitational force and the magnet reaches terminal velocity we can say that it reaches terminal velocity because um, when you look at the changing magnetic field inside the inside the tube the faster the magnet is falling then the greater the change in magnetic field which means the greater induced current which means the greater um, induced magnetic field so um, it actually pretty quickly reaches terminal velocity which means that for the aluminum tube we have mg acting down the, uh, downward okay we've got a magnetic force acting upward and those two are equal to each other so that means the acceleration equals zero and that means we have reached terminal velocity okay but so we can see from the results of this why um, the the magnetic force and the induced magnetic field has to produce that upward force um, but it's that's an observation uh, but the question is well what if it what if the induced current was in the other direction and and, and it produced a downward force um, basically nature won't allow that because if it produced a downward force it would accelerate more uh, it would it, it would accelerate to a to a um, greater an acceleration greater than little g and basically what that means is that the the system the the magnet tube system would end up with more energy than was put in so if you think of this in the energy perspective if we're talking about the tube and the and the magnet so there's gravitational potential energy um, in the magnet you know when it first starts um, as it goes down it's losing gravitational potential and some of it is changing to regular kinetic energy like we imagine but there's also energy in that magnetic field um, and so if we if the force was downward we'd have more kinetic energy than we normally would and we'd still have energy in the magnetic field that's too much energy so basically um, I'm just gonna put this way we would violate conservation of energy the other thing I will say is there's a like a seven minute video I posted on the portal I didn't want to show it all in this screencast um, called the strongest magnet in the world it's pretty interesting um, uh, they do this demonstration except they have a, an extremely strong magnet it's a 25 tesla magnet it's one of the most powerful magnets in the world um, and they at the end you'll see they drop metal tubes down um, so you get the same effect it's um, and I'll, I'll leave it up to you at the end they tell you how dramatic and how long it takes the metal tube to fall through that magnetic field um, it's pretty amazing and i think a pretty good interesting look at at magnets and how you make those electromagnets all right so lenses law okay so basically i'm going to kind of put it in this terminology here um, so lenses law basically is about which direction will the induced current be and the induced magnetic field and what it says is the um, induced magnetic field 
I'm going to leave some space in there because we're going to call put parentheses and call that be induced. Um, always points in the direction that will, I'm going to put in parentheses, undo the change in the magnetic flux. Okay, I'll leave a little space for my symbols for magnetic flux. That is inducing the current. Okay, so this takes a little while to wrap your head around. Okay, that, that statement to me is not all that clear, um, but we'll see this in a minute. So the magnetic induced magnetic field um, is what I will call B induced. Okay, because there are always two magnetic fields here. There's there's one magnetic field and there's the induced magnetic field. And remember the magnetic flux, flux is phi B. That is inducing the current. Okay, so let's look at this in a little more detail or some examples. So right here I just have a single loop of wire and we're going to put a magnetic field in there. And what we're going to say is that the initial magnetic field, so if I can draw these magnetic field lines, we're going to say that that magnetic field is going to point upward. Okay. So right now, if that magnetic field is constant, there's no change in flux, and there's no current running through that loop. Okay. But if we have a, let's say the magnetic field is getting stronger, so it's increasing. So what we want to do, that will show up as more magnetic field lines. So that is B. All right. So what we need to ask ourselves is the flux increasing or decreasing. So phi B. Okay. Um, so we have greater magnetic field inside the loop. So that magnetic flux is increasing. So now we have changing magnetic flux, which is going to induce a current in this coil of wire. So the current is either going to go around kind of clockwise or counterclockwise if you look at it in this. So the question is, which direction is it going to be? And the key to figuring that out is Lenz's law. So basically what we want to do is we know that the induced magnetic field from that current is going to try to undo this change in flux. So if the flux is getting bigger, the induced magnetic field is going to try to make the change smaller. Okay. So in our drawing, what that means is that this induced magnetic field will be downward. it's always going to be opposite the change so it's kind of undo that change so our induced magnetic field is going to be in the downward direction okay and that's what Lenz's law tells you okay so we know that but the question is not usually what direction is the induced magnetic field going to be in. The, the more typical way to ask the question is what direction is the current going to go in. Okay, so if we want to look at the current, so to get the direction of the current, okay, so we're going to use our right hand rule And so our right hand rule for a coil of wire in the, in the magnetic field, so this is basically the solenoid right hand rule, says your thumb is equal to B B induced, and then your fingers
curl in the direction of the current. So in this case your thumb is down and so um, in the front part remember I'm trying to draw this so like the the coil is, is basically horizontal. I'm trying to represent that two-dimensionally so that means the current is going to go in the front it would be to the left and in the back it would be to the right so that means that the current is going to go this way. Okay. All right, so now let's look at it in the other other way. So let's say now we have a magnetic field and let's say it's a strong magnetic field to begin with. still have it up for the time being. Okay, so that's B. Okay, and then it's getting weaker. So if it's getting weaker, again, we're having changing flux because the magnetic field is changing inside that area. So we know that the magnetic flux phi B is decreasing. Okay, so our induced magnetic field is going to want to sort of undo that change. If it's getting weaker, it's going to try to build it back up to keep it from getting weaker. So that means our induced magnetic field is actually going to be upward this time because it's trying to undo that. So that means B induced will be upward. So B induced is upward which means, so if we do the direction of current, we know the thumb is going to be up. Because that's with B induced. So if you're looking at this, that means if your thumb is up, and that means like on the right hand side the current must be going this way and on the left hand side the current must be going that way. Okay, So that's the, the thought process that you have to go through and it's confusing because there are two different magnetic fields, we got the current going around so it takes some practice. Um, so let's take a look at a specific example um, that uses this. So there are some classic kinds of questions uh, that come up, at least the format of the question. So, the, so um, in, the, in what we just looked at you had a coil of wire and the flux was changing because the magnetic field was changing. Um, this is another classic way to ask the question. And in this question the magnetic field stays constant but the area is going to be changing. So in this one when we see those X's, the X X's represent a magnetic field. So B is uniform and into the page. Okay. And we have this this rectangular loop of wire um, that is moving through the field. Okay. So the flux is only, you know, deals with that. So we need to put a dimension on here. So I'm going to call this dimension H. And we're going to call the amount of the loop that's actually in the magnetic field, we're going to call that X. Okay, don't confuse that with the, with the X's that represent the direction of the magnetic field. Okay, so the value of the magnetic flux, so if we go to magnetic flux, and then 
Okay, if we look at the overall definition, it's the integral of b dot dA. Oh, but you know, this is just like our normal situations. We know that b is uniform, and so and a is just a rectangle, so we're just going to have b times a. And the area, it's a rectangle, pretty simple, is going to be x times h. Okay. So that's the magnetic flux. Um, now what we want to do is look at the magnitude of the induced EMF. So remember this is Faraday's law. The induced EMF is equal to minus d phi b dt. Now they asked about magnitude, so right away we know the negative sign doesn't really matter. Okay, um, We just want to know the number. So you can drop it. I'll carry it along, but it's not important to the problem at all. Okay, so that means we are taking the derivative with respect to time of phi b, which is b x h. Okay, so again, like we always do, we really have to ask ourselves which ones of those are constant and which is changing with time. Okay, and so if you look at that, well, b is uniform, it's not changing with time, so it's a constant. Is x changing with time? Yes, because the coil is moving. Is H changing with time? No. So that mean, means when we take this derivative, you just have minus B H DX DT. And again, the minus sign really doesn't matter. And DX DT, oh, hey, DX DT is just equal to velocity. So you have minus B h v okay so that is the value so you can if you think about it it kind of makes sense so so what could we do to increase the emf we can make b stronger we could make h bigger so that would change the area if we increase the area of the loop that's inside the magnetic field that would increase the emf and we and if we moved it faster so if you remember that other video about induction, when the guy moved the magnet faster within the coil, we got a larger current. That means we had a larger induced EMF. Okay. All right, so now here's the question. What is the direction of the induced current? Okay, so this is where we have to think through Lenz's law. Okay, so, um, so let's look at the magnetic flux. Is it increasing or decreasing as that thing moves that way? I'll give you two seconds to think about it. Hopefully it's obvious that it is decreasing. So therefore, the B induced, the induced magnetic field would point which direction? So if we want, it's trying to keep it from decreasing so that means that the induced magnetic field is into the page so using our right hand rule you want your thumb going into the page and your fingers are going to cool, curl around in the direction of the current around the loop so that means that in looking at this that means I will be clockwise So we're going to have our induced current traveling that way. Okay. Another question that's often asked, um, and sometimes this is just what they ask you and they don't really give you the middle steps, but they want to know how many amps of current will flow. Okay. Well, that's just going back to Ohm's law. We know that current is equal to EMF over R. So that induced EMF, again, the sign is going to matter. So I'm just going to say B H V over the resistance R. So not a hard question. Um, all right, so hopefully um, that gives you a good, good sense of Lenz's law. So two things that we're going to accomplish before spring break. Um, I'm going to give you a quest assignment. 
that that deals with the magnetism and induction stuff. I don't like the book problems, um, especially for induction. And then um, there's also a uh, a pivot uh, lab um, that is set up very much like um, this problem here. So um, I want you to go through that and actually generate some data, and you can see some of these relationships. All right, so. Uh, that concludes this screencast.